Hello and welcome to the show Echo at Africa. We take you to Zanzibar where fishermen are learning about a new treasure in the sea. Then in Cameroon, we see how trash is turned into a component of road construction. And we return to Germany, go on the ground to explore an innovative energy storage solution. Welcome once again to Echo at Africa. I'm Neota Igbe. Our first report takes us to the German capital, Berlin. As the city expands, urban gardening is becoming a hit amongst the residents. The concept itself is nothing new, but the way one local startup is growing produce could be an indication of how food will be produced in the future. Urban farming isn't just a hisper trend, but has some advantages over traditional agriculture. It's nearly 30 degrees Celsius, and there is no shade. But that's perfect for these vegetables. This is a greenhouse in the middle of Berlin, where things like cucumbers and lettuce are grown. The company's two founders don't come from a farming background. Good. Then we pack them also to the others and we can then later So we do But they are businessmen with the aim of selling their vegetables right at the point of harvest. Production right in the city center allows us to make direct delivery. Short transport routes, no cold chains. It's very resource efficient. A chef from a neighboring restaurant stops by. Today he's looking for fresh herbs and cucumbers. For the whole enterprise to be profitable, it has to be done on a certain scale. The urban farm yields 35 tons of vegetables each year from 1,800 square meters of surface area. And starting this fall, there will also be fresh fish. The pink perch are still growing in the basins behind the greenhouse. Niklas Leschke hopes to sell 40,000 each year, and he plans to use the water from the fish to raise the vegetables. Fish excretions go through a biofilter and are turned into nitrate the classic plant fertilizer. And that nitrate-rich water will be piped into the greenhouse and used by the plants. So the wastewater from the fish becomes the fertilizer water for the plants. And that way we can make organic fertilizer for the plants. Volkmar Koite thinks urban farming is the wave of the future. He does research at the Fraunhofer Institute in Oberhausen with, among other things, light. Here, LED lights replace the sun indoors and use much less energy than standard lamps. Different colors and different wavelengths result in different growth rates in Swiss chard and basil. Koita is convinced that urban farming also has a rosy economic future. He says the United States and Asia have already made great strides there. His institute develops LED systems for the German subsidiary of a Japanese company. These systems are being developed, and not by market gardens or startups like in Germany or elsewhere in Europe, but by major tech companies. A company like Toshiba or Panasonic already has experience with LED lighting, so of course they're approaching it from that angle. They already have the technology, they just have to adapt it for new applications. Back in Berlin, the two company founders are also thinking big. They've been selling their urban farming system to others, and the entire concept has won them several awards. And just recently, they built a vegetable and fish farm on the roof of a Swiss company. But in the future, they want more of their own farms, in order to earn from them as well. Our focus right now is on planning and building farms like this for clients. We build them as general contractors, ready to use. But I have an idea for the future that's very important to me. I'd like to set up a supermarket chain in the city, and we can only do that with our own farms. The cucumbers are now ready to be served in the restaurant nearby. The head chef is impressed by the quality of the produce, and several investors have also developed a taste for the concept. The founder has raised more than one and a half million euros in capital to expand their business. Now they just have to prove that it will work. Statistics from the Ministry of Environment and the Protection of Nature shows that 600,000 tons of plastics are produced in Cameroon each year and not properly disposed of after use. 
plastic waste of all sorts flood neighborhood streets and markets, causing health hazards and environmental damage when burnt or left at the mercy of rainwater for disposal. The former Cameroonian football legend, Roger Miller, who is currently a soccer ambassador, has laid the foundation stone of a plant specialized in plastic recycling with the potential to create about 2,500 jobs. For most Cameroonians, it's just trash. But for Pierre Kamsoulum, it's a valuable resource. His plan is to introduce plastic recycling to Cameroon on a large scale. When we were children back in the village, we often sat around the fire and burned old plastic bags. They melted and we made balls from that. But this is not about toys. By adding sand, the molten plastic is mixed into a paste and pressed into molds. Most of the people working here are youths from underprivileged families. They are learning a skill that will be greatly needed in Cameroon, producing cobblestones and slabs. There's a lot that needs to be accomplished. We lack breathing masks. I still have to find them. I want them to wear breathing masks, especially when replacing the filter. The project has been made possible by the man who was the world's best footballer in the 1990s World Cup. Roger Milan, who is now a soccer ambassador, is funding it through his foundation Cœur d'Afrique, or Heart of Africa. When you have finished your football career, you have to find something you can do. I decided to look for ways to help Cameroonian youths. Mila has made his cobblestone workshop his flagship project. This morning he's taking around a friend to see the work that's been carried out. Georges Seba is a Cameroonian French pop star visiting the capital Yaoundé. I saw a documentary on television about it and was very much interested to have a look. I think it's something that really needs to be supported. For years, Pierre Kamsoulum traveled through Africa trying to sell his idea. Eventually, Roger Mila brought him back to Cameroon. Now, together with his girlfriend, he's looking for a house. At the moment, he lives with one of Mila's employees. I think it's time I took full responsibility for my life and have a family. The next step is that we would like to get married. Pierre's project promises more stability in his life. He wants to build dozens of such workshops across Cameroon. Eventually, he hopes, his idea will be used in all of Yaoundé's walkways. Environmental protection goes hand in hand with conservation. It's one thing to demonstrate the importance of biodiversity in theory, but how do you set about actually documenting and measuring species numbers? Specially trained experts in the Democratic Republic of Congo are turning to laser technology to help save vast stretches of threatened forest and savanna. It's quiet on the savannas along the lower reaches of the Congo River, much too quiet. Where once large herds came to drink at watering holes, there's now little sign of life. The large African fauna has disappeared, having fallen victim to merciless hunting. Biologist Menard Mbende and his colleagues from the WWF Environmental Organization are doing research in this deserted grassland. They're assessing how much biomass and biodiversity still exist in the Congo Basin. Even the smallest signs of life are important. Antelope hoof prints in the mud. Each detail is carefully measured. We're doing a kind of inventory of the fauna here. There used to be animals like elephants and lions. So we're seeing what's still here and what isn't. Mm -hmm. 
Data are also collected from the air. An airplane flies over carefully chosen areas in the Congo Basin. On board is a LIDAR system, a laser that scans the ground. The data it delivers can be analyzed to determine the condition of the forest, whether it's still intact or has been damaged by clear cutting or grazing. The result is a three-dimensional map indicating tree height, buildings, roads and open areas. Those data are then used to calculate how much carbon dioxide the region can absorb. The Congo Basin is nearly as large as Western Europe. It will take many months for all the data to be gathered and analyzed. But then they'll be worth money, according to Elvis Chibazu from WWF. It's an important opportunity for the Democratic Republic of the Congo in regard to preserving the forest and in preparation for future trading with CO2 certificates. Aurélie Shapiro heads the project to assess biomass along the Congo with the LIDAR laser surveying system. She says the aircraft isn't enough. The measuring really needs to be done from space. So we're using satellite imagery to complement the airborne LIDAR data to effectively view the entire country in one image from space to be able to see all of the forests at once. And that view is cause for concern. Satellite expert Eddie Bongweli says large parts of the Congo Basin are still forested. But the rainforest is shrinking. To get this uh, map, we processed 8,000 satellite images from NASA. And we have um, def def deforestation around big cities uh, where you, we can see in Kisangani. And we have also deforestation in the eastern part of Congo where we had a um, conflict in the past. Menard Mbendi and his WWF team continue to gather data about the plant and animal world. It's necessary but arduous work, and the weather is very hot. The counting is done within a precisely measured area. The researchers extrapolate that data about biomass to the entire forest. This is our predetermined area in which we examine the height of the trees, their circumference and the color of the wood. We examine the entire biosphere and then compare that data with what comes from LIDAR. The researchers combine the data from the ground, the airplane and satellite. In a few months they'll be able to publish a map covering the biodiversity and biomass of the whole country. Knowing which species are there and which ones have disappeared is a crucial step for bringing back the country's wildlife. And now we head back to Germany, where the government has decreed that by 2020, around a third of the country's energy has to come from renewables. That will fill the gap left by coal and nuclear power plants, which are going offline. One of the biggest problems with solar and wind energy is being able to access it when you need it. We went on the ground to look at a project that aims to solve the storage challenge. It's a long way up from the depths of this coal mine. Geologist Uri Schreiber says the mine is a windfall because after miners have finished extracting coal from the pit, it may be a suitable site for generating energy. Mining of anthracite coal in Germany is supposed to end in 2018. Once the last load of coal has been brought to the surface, the pit may be used to store energy from renewables. Scientists are investigating whether it would be possible to convert the mine into a pumped storage power plant. The advantage is that it covers a large area that we can use. We can get trucks in here to install turbines and power transformers. Heavy loads can easily be taken down. That's a big plus. The scientists have made many trips into the mine recently. In the future, the plan is that water will travel the same route, but at a much higher speed. Water will be let into the pit when the sun isn't shining or there's no wind, but there is still a demand for power. 
turbines and transformers will harness the energy generated as the water descends. When the sun and wind produce surplus power again, it will be used to pump the water back up into a storage reservoir above ground. But is it that simple? The researchers are trying to find out. At a depth of 1,200 meters, they're examining the shafts where they plan to store the water. They want to know if there's enough room for a pumped storage power plant. And is the mine stable enough to withstand the water and the turbulence created when it surges through? They also want to know where the air will go when the water comes in. If I want to store water below ground, I need a tunnel system. This system either has to be built, or I've got to use a system that is there and expand it, or shore it up, as the miners say. Much of what is now in the mine will have to come out. Reinforced concrete pipes have to be built to allow the water to flow down towards the pump with a minimum of resistance and be brought back up to the surface on demand. And are there chambers to house the generators and transformers? Is the mine geologically robust enough for the job? The researchers say their study shows it's doable, but they need an investor. Pumped storage power plants are like subterranean storage batteries. The model could be introduced around the world, especially in coal mining regions. They're still extracting coal here, but Ulrich Schreiber already has a vision of the future. If you take a look around, there's a huge area available. The power plant would be built below ground and a storage reservoir would be dug on the surface to get the whole thing running. It could occupy a large area and the water levels would change. But green areas could be created at the edges of a separate area where water levels could be kept constant. That would improve the area enormously. Coal is being phased out and renewables are coming. And perhaps Ulrich Schreiber's storage lake will be built and people will live amidst the greenery on its shores. Cool idea pumping water into disused coal mines. And while we're talking about unlikely realities, let me present to you Dan Ruskat from the Netherlands. He also had an idea that did not seem realistic at first, but got in touch with us to share his story. Every week we present ordinary people who, despite all odds, put creative, extraordinary ideas into reality and turn this planet into a better place. And Dan Arusgaard is one of those people who are doing their bit. Dan Rosgaard is a Dutch artist and innovator. He's based in Amsterdam, one of the party hotspots in Europe. Dan is always looking for more clean sources of energy. So he designed a dance floor that produces electricity. The floor tiles harvest the boundless energy of the moving dancers. The concept behind it, everything that moves or vibrates creates energy. The system powers lights and DJ booths, but that's not all. In the future, even staircases could help produce electricity. We like that. Are you also doing your bit? Then tell us about it. You can visit our website or send us a tweet. And we'll share your stories. From the thumping beats of the dance floor to the white sands of Zanzibar, located just off the coast of Tanzania, the island looks like a picture book paradise, but even in paradise, there can be trouble. Years of overfishing have left many of Zanzibar's inhabitants struggling to make ends meet. The sea, however, offers an alternative bounty. The fishermen return from Jambiani's lagoon with the tide. They've been out since the early morning. Now the eight men divide up the meager catch. The skipper is not at all pleased. Uh, today is uh, bad luck because uh, we get uh, 
Not a lot of, not a lot of fish. Nassau uses drag nets with a fine mesh, but still comes up with only a handful of fish. They'll put out again tonight with the next tide. Stone Town is the old section of Zanzibar City. Here, the fishermen auction off what they brought up from the sea in the morning to the island's many hotels and restaurants. Mohamed Okala from Jambiani has also come to the city to sell what he harvests from the sea. He's been supplying the souvenir shops of Zanzibar City for over a year now. Uh, 14. 14. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're natural sea sponges, a popular gift item. They can be used as bath sponges. Christian Fatalas of Switzerland had the idea. He met Mohamed Okala when he first came to Jambiani in 2003, and they started the Marine Cultures NGO. Both were already aware that the island's development had taken a dangerous turn. Just people now, they are struggling just to search for the, uh, the, the, the job. Some of them, they go into the bush to cut the uh, forest, the things which is not good, so more disasters are coming. So in fact, uh, communities, they don't have, uh, still they don't have alternative way to, 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 to solve the problem. It all started when I was observing the women who farm seagrass as they worked in the water. I thought it was good that they weren't just hunting and gathering, but actually growing something. That impressed me. But when I saw how much they were getting for their produce, I thought there must be a marine product people here can farm and earn a decent income with. In a good month, Kazija Omar Ali and Nasiri Hassan Haji used to make around 27 euros from the seagrass. Now they can get almost as much for a single sponge. But they had to learn how to swim for their new crop. The sponge farms lie several hundred metres out from shore. One kilogram of sponges can pump through and filter one tonne of seawater per day. Farming seagrass is very hard work. It's exhausting because you have to haul these wet sacks. And you never have to carry heavy loads with sponge farming. Demand is brisk, greater than what the farms here can supply. But marine cultures had decided to farm sustainably. All the sponge explants come from their own production. It takes at least one year for one to grow big enough to be harvested. Sea is like a land. If you harvest things without to plant, it means that the seed will be up, disappear. But if you just harvest and plant again, so it will be again and again and again. Sea sponges have natural antibacterial properties, making them useful to people suffering from allergies or certain illnesses. They can even be sterilized. <laughs> The sponge farmers clean and process the day's harvest at home. We had no idea there were people who used sponges to wash with. Now I'm using one myself. Out on the lagoon, Marine Cultures is at work on an entirely new project. Its first plantation for aqua farming coral. The next step might be to establish a protected area inside the lagoon. Then the coral could also be used to replenish natural coral stocks. Marine Cultures has already got some of the local fishermen on board for the idea. Musa Jekovwe is working on a dima, a traditional fish trap. 
First of all, we have to stop using these modern fishing methods. No more putting out at night, no more drag nets. And then we'll have to see if we can catch enough with our traps again. We have to change something. Keeping the lagoon healthy and well stocked is a village effort. That's our package today on Echo at Africa. To we bring you another edition. I want to thank you so much for being a part of the show. Check out our website for our coverage on environmental issues and innovations in green technology. You can also have your say via our social media platforms. To bring you another edition, bye-bye. <laughs>